Most people think of the Civil War as the South versus the North, Union versus Confederate. We're going to take you behind the scenes during the Civil War in North Carolina to show you how during wartime, some of us were fighting a different fight, our own fight, a fight for our rights. First, we're going we to see rights. what problems Lumbee people were dealing with near Wilmington and how they solved it. Mm -hmm. During the war, Wilmington was an important port for the Confederacy. Why was that? Well, the Confederates needed a fort to protect Wilmington. The amount of manpower needed to build Fort Fisher was so great, the Confederate Army tried to force the Lumbees into the effort. Their fancy word for it was conscription. The Home Guard, a band of local men who were either too old or too young to fight in the army as soldiers, were in charge of making sure Lumbees did the work. As you can guess, Lumbees did not like being forced to work on the fort for little or no pay at all. Many Lumbees escaped, but a large number were still made unwilling and unpaid workers. Did someone say slavery? It sure sounds like slavery. Some people began to fight back against the Home Guard and its violence including a young man named Henry, Henry Barry Lowry. With some friends, family, and other local men who also hated the Home Guard, the Lowry Gang was born, and the Lowry Lowry began. There are still Lumbee in North Carolina today, and we were able to interview two of the tribe's leaders in Raleigh at the annual American Indian Heritage Celebration. Henry Barry and his gang were known as being excellent guerrilla fighters. They could hide out in the swamps, they knew the swamps very well, and so that was their comfort zone. And um, so they had different set hiding places in various communities they could hide out in and the support of the community. One of their first big targets was a man named James Brantley Harris. He had killed three Lumbee men and mistreated the Lowry women, so the Lowry gang wanted revenge. Henry Barry Lowry was the local Robin Hood. People noticed that he killed only rich people who had something to do with his father's and brother's death, deaths, and he only stole from wealthy people connected to the Home Guard. At one point, North Carolina's Governor James Worth put a reward out for Henry Barry Lowry's capture. Rumors say that he killed himself, that he was shot, or that he escaped to another place, but no one knows for sure. What we do know is that he was a great man who fought against discrimination so that Lumbees could live their lives on their own terms. He is not the only brave man in this video. There is one more who stands for a different cause and has a different face, and both of them know their way around a pistol. Before 1861, the journey to freedom for, for enslaved blacks was long and treacherous. All of that changed in 1862 when Union forces grabbed portions of the North Carolina coast centered on Newburn. Now, for enslaved people in the South, the promised land was that much closer. New Bern grew into a thriving city with a huge, working, business-owning, elite black population. It is there that we will find a man with abilities equal to the great mysterious hero, hero known as Henry Barry Larry. The migration of fugitive slaves to the booming population that is New Bern was the beginning of an unsung civil rights movement in North Carolina a century before the well-known civil rights movements of the mid-20th century. There, the freedmen and fugitive slaves met up with a charismatic spy master, more cunning than any James Bond could ever be. More skills than Chuck Norris. I mean, what? maybe not that skilled, but you get the point. I mean, get this, 6,000 people came to his funeral. That's gosh. even more than the entire population of New Bern at the time. His name was Abraham Galloway, and he was so secretive that only one picture of him exists. We were intrigued by Galloway's stories, and we wanted to find out more. So we went to the historian David Soselsky, who had spent seven years tracking down the history of this elusive character. It's always a challenge to recreate the lives of slaves, you know, before the Civil War. Galloway never had much money. He ne you know, there's no land records, there's no tax records. He's never in the census. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing research on Abraham Galloway, mm -hmm. I read that he kind of separated himself from the Union soldiers and started to focus more on the um, free people in the South. Sure. The Union's commitment, the North's commitment to African-American freedom 
was far too weak. Lincoln wanted to end the war, and it often seemed that he would settle for compromises that would allow slavery to continue. Galloway was not convinced that President Lincoln and the North were, there, were fighting the Civil War to free the slaves. His work as a Union Army spy sort of moves towards becoming an organizer of the freed people, of the former slaves. And gradually, he, he, part of his work behind enemy lines becomes helping those people kind of pull together and, and make their way to freedom. Galloway was also sympathetic to another group of people, the women. During his time as a North Carolina senator after the war, he presented many bills that promoted women's political, social, and economic rights. Many women were struggling when their husbands, sons, and fathers went off to war. There were 135,000 households in North Carolina at the time, and 120,000 men from the state were in the Army. Wow. So almost every household had at least one man serving the Army. We wanted to learn more about the women's experience on the home front during the Civil War, so we talked to our friend LeRae while we were in New Bern. She is an expert on the history of North Carolina. So, um, during the occupation, uh, access to goods and services for New Bern was different than it was in other parts of the state. Now, the problem in that equation is access to money. So there were women most of the time, these were African-American enterprising women. We know two of them, Mary Jane and Sarah Connor. And they were New Bern women. We're not sure if they were enslaved before the war, but we do know what they did when the Union got here, which was to find a house that was vacant. They turned it into a boarding house. They leased rooms out. They cooked for the soldiers. They mended their clothes. And they made an enterprise for themselves. And that's just the perfect example of making lemonade out of lemons. Most people know the story of the 1838 Cherokee Trail of Tears, which forced thousands of Cherokee Native Americans from their homes to Oklahoma on a treacherous walk covering more than 2,000 miles. What is not as well known is that over 400 North Carolina Cherokee eluded the dragnet and remained in the remote Snowbird Mountains. In addition, 600 were exempted from the removal because William, William Holland Thomas helped them to get North Carolina citizenship. Others who were forced to go to Oklahoma found their way back. Thomas was a white man, so he had a lot of power and could represent the tribe in the federal and state government. We checked in with Joel Queen, a Cherokee potter, who we met at the American Indian Heritage Celebration. We asked him what he knew about Will Thomas and the Eastern Band Cherokee. I'm a ninth generation potter out of my family on the Big Meat side. I make pots for a living. I do artwork for a living, so I come down, I demonstrate, ask, answer questions, and basically just show everything what we do. Will Thomas, he taught us more about the political governments probably more than anybody because he was able to petition the state courts, um, North Carolina especially, allowing the Eastern Band to stay in the mountains. Um, that's probably the biggest and the greatest thing he done for us was allowing us to stay here instead of going on a removal. 